So we are live and we should be able to see people. Yes. And people will start trickling in. Hi, everybody. Hello. Welcome to the, the next, Gather Project. The Gather Project, the next edition of What's Your Story. Today, we are fortunate to have Blair Cohen with us, a dear friend and uh, talent agent and partner and board member at UTA and going to be uh, interviewed by the great team from USC, Stefan and Max. Um, you know, Blair, thanks again for doing this. Uh, you know, really, as we've said before, it's, it's um, really been a lot of fun and we've learned a lot ourselves from listening to these. So it's been great. You know, for those of you who are tuning in, please check out gatherproject.net for more information about everything that we're doing. You know, this show we do every other week. Uh, we have a movie club starting next week where we'll have a Q&A with the line producer of Borat for that movie. So check that out. Um, but I think that's enough of it. I haven't seen it. It would be the wildest ride of 2020. Oh my gosh. <laughs> and certainly timely. Certainly Very timely. relevant. Very without, relevant. Without, without spilling any secrets, it's certainly timely. But um, so with that, with that we'll yes, turn it over. It over. We'll, we're going to mute ourselves and hide ourselves. And thank you, everyone. Thank for you, joining. guys. Thank, thank you for having me, Kevin and Francesca, and everybody. Of course. Yeah. Thank you. And you guys go to it and have fun. Yes. Thank you, guys. All right, Max, you want to go ahead and introduce yourself? Yeah, I'm Max. Um, I go to USC. I'm a sophomore and I'm majoring in communications. And it's a really awesome pleasure to be interviewing today, you today, Blair. Thank you. Thank you for having me. And nice to meet you over Zoom. I wish we were in person, but here we I are. I know. <laughs> I'm <laughs> Stefan. I graduated last year from Emerson, but I'm helping out with the LA chapter. And I just want to start off with a question we've been asking all of our guests, and that's, is there a specific movie or TV show that first got you interested in working in this industry as a kid or earlier on? Well, my favorite show as a kid was Mary Tyler Moore. I think more to do with feminism than anything else. I just thought she was like the most um, iconic. I mean, I'm cer certainly dating myself here, um, but, uh, but that was my show. I never missed a single episode. Um, and I've always loved female driven movies, um, and, and television shows. Um, so I love Lucy and all the big physical comedies, um, were like the TV that I grew up on. Carol Burnett, just a really, really funny, uh, body women of comedy in those, in the seventies, uh, going into the eighties. And then, um, you know, I mean, I've always just loved comedy. Like I was that kid that would like keep my eyes, like, you know, I would hold my eyes open to get to Saturday Night Live. Like I, even as a, like, as a really young kid, I was watching Saturday Night Live. Um, so that was the television that influenced me. I guess the early Mel Brooks comedies were the, com oh, yeah. like my dad loved Monty Python. He loved Mel Brooks. So that was the comedy that really influenced me. He turned me on to the Marx Brothers Duck Soup was a movie that I saw like as a kid many, many, many times. Um, and then as I got older and started really learning about filmmakers and filmmaking, um, I loved, um, you know, Billy Wilder. I mean, all the like classic, great, you know, Harold and Maude was a movie that really influenced me. Um, I could go on and on and on. All, all the... Um, you know, early Sidney Pollock, early Elaine May, Mike Nichols movies, oh, yeah. like those were the things, Heartbreak Kid. There are so many. This is a bad question to ask me because I could go <laughs> for like 15 minutes. Anyway. No, this is it's my, great. Yeah. It's great. I mean, you know, knowing what kind of work you've gone into, it totally makes sense, which, you know, we'll get that. We'll get to that later on. Um, but it's really cool to see like where that interest came from. Um, so you attended Sarah Lawrence, is that correct? A small That's liberal true. arts school, if people don't know. And you graduated from the writing program. Did you find that your experience attending that school, did you find it having any influence in your decision to pursue this career in entertainment, talent representation? I didn't really know about talent representation. Like that wasn't something that was readily available to us. Um, you know, as we were learning about film, really, and creative writing. Um, but what I did come to learn in that writing program was that I was not a great writer. 
Um, but that I, but that I had good instincts about storytellers, good storytelling, how to edit, how to give people notes. Like I was, people came to me for, for notes. And so I was trying to figure out how I could convert that into a profession. Um, and I did some internships in New York, um, around, you know, magazine publishing journalism, um, just trying to figure out if I could get into, into publishing or some kind of editorial job. Um, because I was just, I could, I could feel that I was good at telling people like where the rhythms were off in their stories, that kind of thing. Mm -hmm. Um, I came to LA a little bit by accident the night of my graduation. Um, my mom had moved here from Miami where I had grown up and I didn't really have enough money to make ends meet in New York. So I was going to come to LA, live with her, get a job, save some money, go back to New York. That was always the plan. And I got a job. I knew some people at Sarah Lawrence before me who introduced me to people, which is sort of how it works. Right. And, um, and I got a job at, a, at an agency um, that interestingly was one of the agencies that merged um, to become UTA, the agency that I'm currently at. Um, it was a small boutique agency. It was called Bauer Benedek. It was a literary agency for the most part, representing amazing filmmakers at the time, Brian De Palma and Larry Kasdan. And just like it was, it was, you know, I mean, kind of mind boggling. I was an assistant there. Um, and then I, and then I left not really certain that I wanted to be an agent, um, trying to just experience other parts of the movie business just because it was interesting to me. And so I worked in development, uh, I worked for an executive at Fox and then I went to work in development. Is this too long by the way, or is this what you want to hear? No, please. I'm please, rambling. Okay. Please then I went to go work at, uh, then Brillstein Gray as a development executive on the film side. Then I went to go work at uh, Oliver Stone's company. Then I went to a production company at Fox. And then I came back to UTA um, as a literary agent in 1997. Okay. So, you, you, yeah, you definitely jumped around a little bit, which is interesting. Um, I'll sort of circle back because you mentioned how, you know, you didn't really know a ton about spe specifically like talent representation and Sarah Lawrence. Like, of course, you were studying writing. Um, so when you got to LA and you started working in the industry, how did it size up to what you, you were expecting? Um, and did you kind of find that like any valuable lessons you found or like any important role models you had that like sort of helped you build yourself up along the way? Okay. Well, first of all, you know, I, I graduated college in 1989, so we didn't have the internet. So there wasn't information readily available the way it is now. There were things that I had gotten my hands on, like there was something called the Hollywood Creative Directory, which was like the phone book for Hollywood. It was like, it listed every production company and who worked there and what their titles were and what their phone numbers were. And that was really like our Bible as, as uh, young assistants in the business. That's where we like found, inf found information on people. And we would write these letters and we would like send them letters. We didn't have, I mean, I know this sounds insane to you at this point, but like we weren't sending emails. Right. We were really writing like solicitation letters that we were putting in the mail to try and get jobs, or we were just cold calling people on the phone on a hard line from a hard line. Mm -hmm. um, so, so the information wasn't as available to me. So it was really through connections. Like everything was like someone you knew who knew someone could get you an interview or a phone interview with. And that's what I was really working was I came to LA. I knew a few people from Sarah Lawrence who had been the year ahead of me, who had grown up in LA and they knew people in the business. And so we were just like networking as fast as we could. That was what we had to rely on to get these gigs. Um, there were so many people um, who helped me along the way. I mean, the person who really helped me the minute I landed in LA, honestly, was JJ Abrams, who was a year ahead of me at Sarah Lawrence. Yeah. And he had, he had grown up in LA and he had sold a spec script with another um, writer. He had co-written it with a woman named Jill Mazursky, who also really helped me sort of like find my way in those, in that first um, year of trying to get, I got a job pretty quickly, but, um, and then it was really like who you knew and, and, and making connections and, um, and kind of 
jumping from one job to the next through connections and people you knew. So when I decided that I didn't want to be an agent and I wanted to go try and get an assistant job at Fox, I had met someone who knew someone who knew someone, right, that was looking for a replacement for her. Mm. Um, And that's how you moved around in those days. I mean, in terms of mentors along the way or people who taught me things, I mean, I would say like working for Oliver Stone was um, was my film school. That's where I really learned about story and story structure in film, watching movies and watching him cut movies and watching him um, write draft after draft of scripts was really like, for me, just my film school experience. Um, when I got to the age and I've had, and I had other mentors along the way, I I worked for two guys named Michael London and Paul Schiff, um, who really were the next phase of teaching me how to develop scripts, um, and how to work with writers and how to identify good storytelling and great film. And I mean, I had that from my Sarah Lawrence education, but I sort of used my relationships working for these men, you know, I was like a sponge just soaking it all up. Mm-hmm. Um, then I got to the agency and, um, and, you know, I just learned from people who were, who were really successful doing it, you know, ahead of me who had had uh, a couple of years on me um, as agents, just watching young agents who are building, you know, their businesses of representing writers, directors, actors. Um, so, I mean, those were the, those were the people who really had an influence on me. I mean, my clients have had the biggest influence on me of anyone, right. you know, because um, just being able to listen to what their hopes and dreams are and what their aspirations are and kind of with that, I mean, we've, you know, most of my clients I've been with since the beginnings of their career and off and, and many of them have been with me since the beginning of my agent career. Um, and so we've just like kind of grown up together in the business. Um, and I would say that they've been the greatest influence on me. That's awesome. Yeah. It sounds like you've done a lot of, you know, a lot of moving around, a lot of communicating. Um, it's a pretty demanding path, obviously. Um, so what are some of the biggest obstacles you found you had to overcome as you were moving up, whether it's, it has to do with that or interpersonally or just like any sort of thing that might've come up that you had to face? I mean, the, I wouldn't say the biggest obstacle because honestly, these obstacles all presented opportunities, but you know, uh, over the 23 years of being an agent, the business has changed so dramatically. Um, and, and, and television has changed so dramatically. Like when I came into my agent business, agent, uh, chapter, there were like four networks, you know, and Fox was just, and Fox was just honestly, just kind of starting out. Um, so watching the television business change so dramatically and the onset of cable was like, what is this and how are we going to navigate this new and changing cable world? What does that mean for our, you know, what does that mean for our TV business? Um, and, and, and now we're, I mean, now, I mean, in the last, obviously in the last couple of years, we've seen, right, this like unbelievable expansion in film distribution with the onset of all of these streamers. Mm. And so you're seeing like studios uh, like Warner Brothers and Disney and Universal just like completely change um, the structure of their business and the model of their business you know, that we have known for 20 some odd years, right? So, um, so you know, they present themselves as obstacles in some way, but on the other side of it is like complete opportunity. Wow, that's awesome. Yeah. That's great. Um, and uh, switching paths a little, but uh, we were wondering, before you had a lot of clients and before you had this, you know, this amazing roster of uh, clients built up, um, what were the first steps you took to getting your first client? And once you got them, uh, how did you find continue finding people after? Was it more of that networking that you were talking about? And Yeah. I would say um, 
I had the great luxury of being a development executive before I was a literary agent. You know, most agents grow up through the apprentice mailroom system or have historically, at least as long as I've been in the business. Um, Very few of us come in from non-agent professional experience, Um, more so now than ever as television has changed, right? As like the unscripted business exploded. Like when I started at UTA, we didn't even have an unscripted department that didn't even exist. So now, you know, but when I was coming into the agency, most of the agents had grown up through the mailroom system. And um, I had had this great benefit of working with so many writers and, and, and falling in love with their work, right? Falling in love with uh, their version of storytelling. And some of the uh, writers that I had come into contact with as a development executive didn't even have representation. You know, it'd be like a friend of a friend sent their script to me. I read it. I'd give them notes. I mean, I was so, I was young. I mean, I started at the agency when I was 29, but from 22 to 29, I was just meeting writers and directors and people who were like just starting out um, just post-college. So once I became an agent... Um, sorry, my dog just walked in. Um, once I became an agent, I, there were so many storytellers and writers, uh, that I was excited about, um, getting into business with and helping shepherd. And so I did it judiciously because I didn't want to just go out and sign a ton of people and have to break a bunch of careers. But there were a couple of people who I just could see a long road ahead for them. Um, and so I, I started signing them. And then a lot of it is word of mouth. A lot of it is just, you know, uh, reputation. You know, once you build some credibility with some clients or you build some credibility out in the business, um, you start to get referrals and things like that. And that's really how you build your business. Do you you think that your background in um, writing when you were in college and stuff like that and giving people notes, do you think that that helped you build that relationship with a lot of the artists you're representing? I do. I mean, not everyone, um, not not every writer or writer director or actor, multi hyphenate, um, wants to hear my notes, but most of them do. And um, you know, I really, I do think I'm unique in that way as an agent. I think a lot of agents would say that they're great at it, but I do think that not just my writing background from school, but my writing back, but, but my, but my background as a development executive working with writers and working with executives who had a lot more experience um, than me, um, I think gave me a leg up when I was, you know, working with these young writers to develop their scripts for sure. That's awesome. That's awesome. Um, So has the way that you approach selecting clients and choosing projects, has it changed since when you first began working as an agent? Not really. I mean, I've always been drawn to um, really original, really audacious, really um, outside the box storytelling. Like I've just, oh, that's always been my thing. And I feel like when I look at, even though my, the list of my clients is so diverse, writing in so many different areas and in different genres, like the through line for me is that all of these movies or television shows have a certain audacity. And honestly, they've been a bitch to get made. Like nothing has been a slam dunk. <laughs> Every one of these like movies and television shows have been like pushing rocks uphill to get them greenlit. I've never had like just a easy drop in the bucket. Yes, we love this. We're making it. It's always been a little bit of a grind. Yeah. Um, yeah. Speaking of those really, you know, crazy and unique scripts, the, the main people that, uh, it seems you represent, um, create, uh, content under a similar genre, R-rated comedies. And, um, it seems like you have a lot of roots in comedy. So we're wondering if this is your favorite genre and is there anything else that, um, draws you to working with these kinds of clients? Um, I mean, I I really believe in the um healing the healing elements of laughter and I really believe in 
the communal experience of a comedy in a movie theater. It's like, I just, uh, there's nothing better than sitting in a movie theater with a bunch of strangers and laughing your face off. Don't get me wrong. I love being at home and laughing, but there's like nothing better. That was mad. And that was a magical thing for me growing up. Um, I mean, I can remember being a little kid and watching this movie called High Anxiety, this Mel Brooks movie in a theater. And just like the communal experience of that was like Mm -hmm. inspiring um, and palpable. Um, So that's what really draws me to comedy. I just think it's, I also think comedy is a great way to talk, uh, to find humor in something that's really challenging and difficult um, can be, can make some intolerable things manageable in a weird way. And I've always felt that way. And I love drama. I do love drama. Mm-hmm. And I love representing dramatic writers and, and actors. And I mean, you know, I, I'm, I'm, I watched Queen's Gambit in like two nights, you know, like I'm, I'm obsessed with that kind of stuff too. But, but I do think comedy is really hard. Comedy is really hard to nail. And I just, I really admire stand-ups, I like the bravery and the, I mean, just the courage to get up on a stage and, and say things that are um, meaningful and funny uh, and bold is like just a wild experience to me. Like Borat, when you guys who haven't watched Borat, who are, who are listening in, I mean, that's just some of the most audacious filmmaking I've ever seen in my life, you know? And I think Sasha Baron Cohen is one of the greatest, boldest artist out there. Um, so anyway, that's my point of view about comedy. That's great. Thank you. Um, and uh, we are wondering, since now you're both a partner and a board member, how's your role and day-to-day responsibilities at UTA expanded or changed since you first joined the agency? Well, there's a lot more, um, there's a lot more management involved, um, which is not something that I studied or have a lot of experience in. Um, but it's something that I love. And as I grew up in the agency and, and, and matured and, you know, just, um, got some wisdom under my belt, I, you know, I started to think about legacy and what kind of company I would be leaving behind. You know, at a certain point you go like, oh, I've been here longer than I might be here going forward. Um, I don't know if I'll be there another 23 years. So you start to think about what's the company, you know, when I started there, there were 50 agents maybe, and now there are 1100 employees. I don't even think there were 50 agents when I started now that I think about it, but, um, you just start to think about what you're, yeah, what you're leaving behind and what becomes more important is really, um, I don't know, for me in the last couple of years, making sure that the company reflects what the world looks like um, and uh, making sure that the storytelling that's coming out of UTA is, it continues to be the storytelling that really shapes and shifts points of view and culture, as I've said. Um, and so making sure that the people working at UTA reflect what the world looks like and making sure that they feel safe and that they, um, that they can have the kind of long career there and be as happy as, as I have been, um, became a real priority for me. Yeah. And, um, speaking of legacy and what you leave behind, uh, you were one of the um, founding members of the Times Up, of Times Up, which was basically a response to the Me Too movement, which is arguably, you know, the most cultural, the most important cultural uh, movement of the decade. And um, we were wondering when when you started your career, did you envision yourself being an activist or going into activism, or did it kind of happen more organically as things went on? I mean, I think that I I grew up in a time where it was hard to be an activist in the workplace, truly. I mean, there were very few women and very few women, there were zero women in roles of leadership when I started at the agency. Um, it was a leadership of straight white men. Um, and that was what the agency business had been for 
50 years or however long it had been, you know, whatever, hundred, however long William Morris had been around hundred years, whatever it was. I mean, that's really what the agency business looked like. White straight guys in suit, black suits with white shirts and ties. And so I, um, I didn't bring my whole self to the workplace. You know, I came in and, um, just tried to fit in more than anything. And, um, tried to, um, accelerate my own business. I mean, nothing was given to me. Everybody that I represent or developed, I signed, um, which wasn't necessarily the case with my colleagues and my peers. Um, so I could see, obviously I could see the glass ceiling and I could see the sexism. Um, I didn't see the misogyny, honestly. I didn't, it wasn't as apparent to me. It wasn't happening to me. And so I didn't see it as acutely and I didn't even hear about it. Um, but I definitely saw the sexism and I pushed back on that. And I really made sure, um, as best I could to mentor from my not very, um, strong position, but as an agent, I tried to mentor younger agents and assistants, um, mostly underrepresented people of color, um, women, um, self-identified LGBTQ. Like I, I, that I knew that was an instinct. And I think part of that came from Sarah Lawrence where activism was always in the culture of Sarah Lawrence. Um, and so I understood it on a cellular visceral level, but I couldn't quite figure out how to execute on it except for my desk, right? My assistant desk. So I was constantly just like pushing for these young women, um, young BIPOC, young LGBTQ people that I was hiring, I was pushing for them to get promoted. And in that little lane, I was successful. Um, and I can count to a number of agents around the company, um, some of who have been made partner, um, who came off my desk. That, that must be really crazy um, get going from you started off at the company when there was no uh, women in leadership positions at all. And now you've worked there and you're a board member. So that's must just must be a pretty well, crazy I, I, thing, right? I mean, it's, cr it is cr it was always a goal. Um, I just oh. couldn't figure out how to get there. I couldn't see the path forward, but, um, so I do credit the me too movement and times up, um, and everything, all that narrative, um, as a moment to recognize, I mean, I, presented myself as someone who wanted that kind of leadership and they heard me. And so I will always be indebted to the leadership of our company who saw that and recognized it um, and honored it. Awesome. Great. Well, shifting gears sort of, you've, you've talked a lot about being a mentor and like helping people uh, form their careers, of course, as an agent. Um, so you've witnessed a lot of careers being formed and sort of you've seen like the beginnings of some great people come about um, and a lot of different paths being taken, of course. So what, what kind of advice would you give for young people who are coming into this industry and hoping to get representation in any way? The first thing I would say is, um, and I say this to clients who I've represented for 23 years, you need to relentlessly and consistently create original material. And if you're a writer, you need to be writing all the time. And um, it's easy to get trapped in the, um, it's, easy, it's easy to get distracted. It's easy to get more than trapped. It's easy to get distracted. You know, if you want to be a writer um, and you need to make a living, you've got to figure out how to make your living while you're writing and you can't let that go and creating original material is imperative to um, finding your path forward. Um, and there's so many ways now to make yourself known. I mean, I can't believe how many young filmmakers we discover just on like the multitude of platforms um, and um, different festivals that have like emerged beyond just like Sundance and South by it's pretty incredible. Um, so I think 
be relentless in the pursuit of it. Don't give up. Um, and really constantly be making stuff. If you, if you want to be a director, constantly be making that. If you want to animate, do just keep doing it and don't stop and don't get distracted. Yeah, absolutely. So for, you know, whether it's writers, directors, um, actors, et cetera, what sort of skills do you see in new talent and like what makes them stand out among their peers? Again, sure it's, it's like, a case by case thing. But like, you know, general. but for the most part, I feel like the people who are afraid to fail, I mean, don't like people who take risks and allow themselves to fail mm-hmm. and make mistakes are the people that I notice flourish the f- most. I, I often think people who are afraid to um, take a big risk, step outside their comfort zone. I keep saying to young people, step outside the comfort zone. It's okay. Fall on your face. It's, it's going to be okay. Like you, That's not going to be your narrative. That's not going to be your script. But if you don't do that, it's going to be really hard to learn beyond, you know, the safety of of college and university, Mm -hmm. you know, get out there and make some mistakes and, and fuck up and you'll learn from it, you know? Of course. Yeah. Um, And sort of, sort of a different sort of question. Um, What are the most common reasons that you find a client of yours will decline an offer for a new project? Wait, say that question again. What are the most common reasons that a client of yours will decline an offer for a new project? Mostly it's about availability. Honestly, I spend so much of my time. It's like a chess. I always say it's like a chessboard of, of dates. I'm constantly trying to figure out how to maneuver stop dates and start dates because most of my clients are honestly working Um, on the actor side. They're constantly working. Um, even through COVID they're working. And so I'm just like, you know, just trying to like figure out, okay, you're going to wrap this TV series to go do this movie. Um, on the writer or director side, I mean, you know, for a director, you know, I always say to them, if they're on the fence about something, imagine being in an editing room. 18 months from now, are you still in love with that? Yeah. Are you still in love with that story? Because you've got to be so obsessed with telling this story in order to live with it for two years. Mm. A writer, it's a little bit easier because there's more flexibility. They can work on their own stuff. I always say with writers, you know what? One for you, one for them, meaning one for you, your original material, and let's write on assignment, which is, you know, can be a drag but is good for their career. So it's different for every, I mean, it's always different for every single client Um, because some clients, like I have some standups, they're on the road. I mean, not right now, but when they're on the road, you know, and a great opportunity comes, but they've already booked a tour. It's it's like, you know, it's really hard. Right. Okay. And circling back, sort of, I just want to ask about this. Um, You mentioned how important it is, you know, um, when I was asking about like people getting representation, how important it is to come up with original material all the time, always be creating content. Um, but it seems like there might be sort of the stuff we see on TV. There's a lot of adaptations and there's a lot of original material too, to balance it out. But um, do you like, what sort of tendency do you see it leaning more towards like uh, the content being more popularly made? Is it originals or adaptations? Like what do people want more and why, why do you think that is? Um, I think the IP is tangible, you know, it's safer. The original content is a little bit riskier for them. And I think what you're seeing is, um, a little bit of a balancing act of, like I said, taking the risk with original content, original material, um, and original storytellers, uh, especially, um, where it's not expensive, you know, like looking at you know, if you look at Netflix, you know, like Stranger Things or Pen15 or whatever, you know, whatever those uh, originals are versus um, uh, anything that's based on IP, you know, 
uh, Queen's Gambit. Like they knew Scott Frank, they knew that material, they knew it was a popular book, you know, they knew they were in safe hands with like an, a masterful storyteller. Um, so, you know, that's a safer bet for them. Um, but I really think it's, I, th- I think it has to do with um, just looking at the landscape of how is it going to impact our bottom line at the end of the year? Mm-hmm. You know, I think that they program now in such a different way than they used to. And I think they look at, okay, we've got, we've got to have X number of dramas, X number of horror, X number of thrillers, X number of comedy, X number, right? And some of that needs to be based on IP because there's a built-in awareness and that's sort of a safe, a safe zone for us versus like the original stuff, which who knows, it's kind of a flyer unless you have Adam Sandler in it, you know, and then it's like, okay, fine. We can bank on that. You know what I mean? So it's just like a, again, a, a puzzle or a, ch- a chessboard a little bit in terms of how they program that stuff. Is that answering your question? No, totally. Yeah. It's, there okay. seems to be like a lot of, it's a, there's a science to it all. It's really fascinating. Yeah, there is. I mean, there are, you know, there's a lot of data, you know, and a lot of whiteboards. I mean, that's how they're, that's how they're programming you know, um, at the streamers and at the, net, at the networks. Right. Um, and speaking of adaptations, um, Marvel movies, the Marvel cinematic universe has become, you know, one of the biggest things in film and entertainment. And, um, a couple of your clients have been signed on to Marvel projects and we're wondering what's your perspective on big cinematic universes kind of taking over the landscape of the market of the films we see today. You mean of the theatrical or, or, or mo- uh, motion picture or um, the theatrical experience or, or all of it? Um, yeah, kind of all of it. Um, I think, you know, as people's home entertainment systems get better and better and um, as prices, I mean, I don't know what the theatrical, listen, I, we're in such a confusing time right now. I don't know what the theatrical experience is going to be post COVID. I think that this is a culture shifting moment in time. And um, I think if, when we get back into theaters, um, the demand from consumers will be that much higher around spectacle filmmaking you know, that sort of big tentpole franchise. Um, I mean, it'll be interesting to see like what the audience is, when the audiences will feel safe going back to a theater, what the makeup of that audience looks like. Um, I think Marvel in their strategy have been absolutely brilliant the way that they've pivoted um, into Disney Plus and Mandalorian. And I, I just think it's absolutely brilliant um what marvel's done specifically and i think all the studios are emulating um that model um so but i do think that when people go back to the theater as it was sort of happening pre-covid people are going to just be i mean audiences consumers are going to be demanding just that kind of spectacle in a theater if they're going to pay that much money to go to the movies um that's what that's what they're going to have to deliver to the theater. Um, in terms of streaming, I think you're going to see um, comedies, thrillers, horrors really find their lives on the streamers for a while. You know, um, that's my instinct. Like I don't have a crystal ball, but I think that's where it's going to live for a while. You know, I think if Borat and Trolls have taught us anything, people are going to be willing to buy at that price and stay home and watch. And they're going to watch, you know? I mean, the number of people that watch an Adam Sandler movie on Netflix is like staggering. You know, Noah Baumbach always says like, nobody watched my movies until I ended up on Netflix. And now more people, you know, watch my movie, like one movie than all the others that came before it. Yeah, yeah, that would be really interesting to see more individualized movies go towards streaming and the spectacle ones go into theaters. Yeah, that makes sense. Um, 
and also a little subject change, but uh, UTA recently has ventured into sports management after its acquisition of Clutch Sports. And um, we were wondering if you have noticed any differences between representing athletes and representing a uh, talent for film. I mean, I'm not so, I, I, I hang around uh, the clutch team and try and integrate with them as much as possible. I think um, what I find so interesting um, in this moment in time is the cross section of sports, music, fashion, film, television. I just love seeing um, how many people are discovering, how many athletes, how many um, uh, fashion designers, how many um, uh, people in like niche business are finding their way into content and storytelling. Um, So that to me is exciting. I mean, in our house, we do love sports, so it's exciting um, just to be around it. But the more exciting part for me is just watching gamers, athletes, digital influencers um, cross over into traditional storytelling and watching traditional storytellers um, cross over into these other areas that have been completely foreign to them before, you know? Yeah. Yeah. And, um, yeah. And we're also going to ask you, um, you know, as, as like you said, people are kind of diving into more things and, um, actors doing other stuff and, uh, digital stars going into traditional forms of storytelling. We're wondering what you think of, um, a lot of the rising TikTok and YouTube stars and, um, and, uh, how a lot of them are making the transition into, uh, normal storytelling. Well, I'm all for it. I I honestly think it's fantastic. Um, I think, uh, I mean, I don't know. I'm not, I'm not on, I'm not really on TikTok. I mean, I hear my kid talk about TikTok a lot and watch TikTok a lot, but, um, but what I think is really interesting, um, is the explosion of the unscripted space, the doc series space. Um, to me, that's really exciting. And um, I think I'm not necessarily, um, I don't watch Keeping Up with the Kardashians. I don't know if the Demelios are the next Kardashians. Like I'm not living in that world as much as my other colleagues are. Um, but I love watching what I love watching what LeBron's doing. I love what Spring Hill is doing. I think that company is the company of the future. Um, and I love that they're involved in doc series and scripted. And I just think it's um, scripted film. I'm excited for Space Jam 2. Like there are things that I think um, non-traditional storytellers are doing that is fabulous and fantastic. And so I'm all for discovering an amazing storyteller um, in a really, um, non-traditional way. I mean, I, I can remember reading an early blog of Tavi Gevinson, a young storyteller, uh, when she was like 13 in some like crazy, uh, uh, story, like there was like a crazy storytelling blog space, um, where all these young women were telling like stories. And I, thought to myself, well, this woman's voice is so unique. I've got to go find her. And we went to Chicago and signed her and she wasn't even 16 yet. Um, and then to watch like where she's gone as an actor, you know, she then crossed into acting and doing theater and, uh, you know, now she's gonna be on Gossip Girl and she's writing to direct a movie. And so like, you never know when you're going di- to, where you're going to discover them. You know, um, I still am so excited discovering non-traditional storytellers in like a theater space, finding Hannah Gadsby at Largo here in LA was like a revelation for me, you know? Um, and I just thought, my God, she's reinventing um, stand-up comedy right before my eyes. It's incredible. I like sat in that audience and I could feel it. Um, so anyway, I don't know. There's just like so many exciting different ways for people to find their voice um, and tell their stories. And I think it's totally cool. 
So you've awesome. touched on a lot of like instincts you have as an agent and looking for story and editing. Uh, we want to circle back a little bit on that. We have a question from the audience. Um, this is from Baylor. What does it take to be an agent, especially when starting out? And specifically, what kind of tasks were you doing when you started out? I know you touched on a little bit, but maybe you can circle back. Well, if you come into the mailroom now, what's nice about coming into the mailroom now is that you do get, we have this thing called UTAU. Um, and at UTAU, you really learn about the agency business, about our agency business. Um, you learn about the mailroom. You learn about uh, getting onto a desk. You learn about covering a desk. You learn all of our phone systems and our, um, you know, all of our different programs about where we keep all of our grids and all of that. Like you just learn about the nuts and bolts, but you also get to hear from so many different agents like this um, who come to um, UTAU and tell their story. Um, and so, I mean, in the mail room, I couldn't tell you what they're doing in the mail room. Now, my days of the mail room do not reflect at all. What happens in the mail room now? Um, it used to be in the old days, you used to push carts around with mail. I don't even know if that exists. Um, but it's a real apprentice program where, um, you come in, you learn about what the agency is all about. You learn about all the different departments, um, you get to shadow, uh, assistants on desks. Um, and then the hope is that you get a desk and then the hope is on a desk, you decide, do you want to be an agent or do you not want to be an agent? There are a lot of assistants that have been on my desks who have, uh, who I've helped get jobs. I call, you know, soft landings out in the world. I have, um, a former assistant working at, uh, 3000 now, formerly Fox 2000, but Elizabeth Gabler's 3000 at, over at Sony now, um, she started out as Amy Pascal's assistant off my desk and then moved over to Elizabeth Gabler's company and is now a full-fledged executive. And I have lots of those stories all around town. Um, and then again, there are a lot of assistants that have come off my desk um, who are in the music department or uh, who have crossed over at Clutch or um, moved over and worked for Seth Rogen and his cannabis company. Like, they're just all over the place. Um, so I think, um, you know, my advice to someone coming into the mailroom is um, use the training program as a place to network and connect with your peer group um, and socialize with your peer group. Um, and also find out by moving around a little bit what excites you. Um, and, um, don't be distracted when you don't get promoted, when you think you need to get promoted, things like that. I find that people really lose track of their career when they're on some sort of timeline. And sometimes it just takes a little bit longer to get to the next phase of your career. And if you can just be patient, um, and continue to learn, I mean, I'm continuing to learn on a daily basis. You know, as the landscape changes, what excites me about what I do is that I'm always, no one day resembles the day before, and I'm always learning something new. And I think if you can take that approach and not be in such a rush, I think young people are in such a rush to get to like these markers. And I think that they lose so much of the, the um, lessons inside the journey because they're so, so in a rush to get to these like markers that we set for ourselves. Thank you for answering that. That's, you know, this whole thing is, um, it's sort of catered to young people, uh, young filmmakers, college age people interested in getting into film. So it's really valuable hearing that. And I totally resonate with you saying that we're all sort of in a rush because you could definitely feel it. There's just so many people and so much going on, but uh, I agree. You gotta like slow down, take your time. Um, but thanks for, thanks for answering that. And if you're uh, making stuff, make sure the stuff is great. Mm -hmm. Create a community around you of people who are going to tell you the truth and make sure that you listen to their notes because not every note is going to be great, but there's going to be insight in that. And don't put stuff out there that you don't believe is great and that your community hasn't told you is great. Like keep working on stuff. I remember that I had a writing teacher at Sarah Lawrence who told me writing is rewriting. Like just, you know, keep, just keep 
refining those stories until they're as good as they can be. Don't put stuff out there that's half baked. Absolutely. You know, don't throw stuff against the wall to see if it sticks. <laughs> I completely agree with that. I love, I love that. Um, now to close off with a similar question to how we started, uh, just a little fact check. I want to make sure this is right. We did some research. We heard that your favorite show was Nathan for you. Is that correct? I love Nathan for you. I need more Nathan for you. Nathan Fielder is a genius. So yeah, yeah, I, I, I agree with that for sure. What fascinates you about the show? Because it's such an unusual show. The humor is so uh, different than a lot of what you see. So like, what do you find interesting about that sort of content? Well, I love, I love, I love um, sitting with my discomfort. Mm. And as I said earlier, like humor um, and discomfort or pain or anything negative is such an interesting combination. And um, I think he puts himself and people in such uncomfortable situations. Um, But they're, um, it's not exploitive in any way. You know, it's like, um, it's got this strange relevance and importance underneath it, um, which I totally appreciate and celebrate in the way that Borat does. Like, I really think Nathan and Sasha Baron Cohen live um, in a similar space. Um, And I just think, you know, it's like we've got to figure out a way to attack things that make us uncomfortable. And sometimes doing it in a humorous way is the easiest way for it to go down. And that's what I love about Nathan for you. Yeah, absolutely. You absolutely. know, yeah, it's definitely very. I was watching last night, very uncomfortable, but like, it's so cathartic seeing it happen. Right. I mean, do you did have you guys watched Dave? The show Dave on FX. Yes. Yes. Yeah. Again, little, Di- little little Dicky. Little Dicky. Yeah. Oh, yeah. 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 Again, like another show that is so uncomfortable to watch, funny, <laughs> painful unique, fresh, original. Like I love those kinds of shows that just like flea bag, just live outside, um, live outside the lines a little bit. I don't know. Anyway, Nathan for you, what a great show. Yeah. When did I say that? I must've said that a couple of years ago. Possibly. Yeah. It's yeah. Still, yeah. We, we need more but it's of it's still amazing, right? More of a show. I completely agree. He needs to come back. Well, okay. I think, uh, that's, about all the time we have. Blair, thank you so much. This has been amazing. Thank you so thank much. You. These were really good questions. I hope that I was able to answer any. I'm going to the chat just to make sure. I think, okay. we, yeah, I, it looks like. No, good. Yeah. Okay, good. Okay, good. I just wanted to say, well, first of all, thank you so much. Um, and Blair, and for anyone that's a communication major, I think you, Blair, just gave a masterclass in in communicating. You are, I, I mean, both Kevin and I the whole time, we're, you know, you just, it, this was incredible and so informative and so interesting. And you are such a masterful communicator. So thank you, because I really think that um, the students, that everybody on, yeah. uh, on this today is taking away so much. And we've been getting little little um, tidbits from people. And, and yeah. thank you so much. I mean, you're just amazing. Well, I was happy to be here. I was happy to be here. Thank you guys for pushing me to do it. Kevin, oh, you I thank you for stepping outside of your comfort zone because we know <laughs> fully we outside know my you, comfort zone. That I you don't like to be behind the scenes, and you don't like <laughs> to do this. And you're that, that's that's why I was laughing yeah. also because I know that you were like, oh, I don't like doing this kind of stuff, and you're just incredible at it. So thank you for this gift because I really think that yeah. the, you know everybody's walking away with so much. Well, I was wonderful. I was going to say too, you know, you talking about two things that really resonated with me. I mean, a lot of things resonated, but two things I think worth mentioning, just talking about that, you know, you think at a certain point, you get to a point in your career and oh, everything should be so easy. Mm. And that no, so it's, it's always a changing always landscape, something. right? Oh, right. You know, oh. there's, it's just, you know, I mean, COVID besides, right? I mean, this has added a whole new, a whole new wrinkle, but there's no, but even as agents, we're like in this tenuous relationship with people who pay us 
to do a service for them, you know? And so yeah. I don't know. I just feel like it's, um, it's an, it's an honor for people to, um, I would say like, it's, I feel honored when somebody signs with me because they believe in me as an extension of who they are out in the community in a way. Um, but I never forget, like I'm on the payroll, like I'm in the service, get, uh, look at that cute dog. I'm in, the <laughs> service, I'm in the service business, you know, I've got to show up for people anyway, COVID or not, I got to show up. Yeah, no, it's, it's, it's true. Cause I just think it's important that there's challenges all along and not to scare off anybody, but if you're going to be committed to, to doing this, you know, you got to be committed to the story and you work, you work and, you know, you, you push and things take time. And, and when you really care about the work that you're doing, it just, it takes time. And then just to stress again, the point of activism, which of course, you know, for everything that we're doing with the gather project it resonates for us. And it always has throughout our career about, you know, finding ways of contributing to, you know, not just the work that we're doing, but what's happening in the community and what's happening around. And obviously the work that you've done with Time's Up is really important mm -hmm. um, and worth. But I do think the audience. stuff that's transcend, the stuff that transcends and the stuff that is transcendent are movies like Moonlight. Um, you know, yeah. move, you know, like yes. movies, like to me, our responsibility, especially at this fragile moment in time is to push storytellers who are um, telling these stories that are going to shift our perspective about things. Mm -hmm. Like, yeah. so for all of you who are listening, like, please be relentless in the pursuit of that. Um, and Hollywood is waking up, you know? And I think, you know, when you see storytellers like Barry Jenkins and Ava DuVernay, and even like Crazy Rich Asians, and, you know, these movies that are breaking yeah. out in the marketplace like that, it's so exciting for me. Um, mm -hmm. So especially, you know, I don't know. I just, I feel like that that right now is our responsibility. Mm -hmm. um, and I think for you young storytellers, like, please keep your eye on that and please keep your heart focused on that. That's really important in terms of activism. Mm -hmm. Well, thank you. And thank everybody who've tuned in. Um, again, this is What's Your Story with the Gather Project. Please check out gatherproject.net and sign up with us. Um, I'll just be safe, Definitely. everybody. Be safe, be safe, be safe. Yeah. Okay. And be kind Before. to yourselves during this time. Definitely. Before we sign off, just uh, check in. We're going to be doing a movie club next week, watching Borat and doing a Q and A with the line producer from that movie. So check in next, you know, check in with us next week. Um, Stefan and Max, great job. Great job. Uh, Blair, Thank thanks again. Thank you. Thank you so much. And uh, we, we have to catch up soon. Yeah. <laughs> All right. Be safe, everybody. Take, right. Bye. Take care. Bye. 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 Thank you. Bye, everybody.